still coming in. Uh, I just want to mention, as we always do, our Squirrel Hill book, which has had a very nice summer of sales. Uh, they are available and back $20 for um, members, $22 for non-members. Uh, there's some posters that describe them. And I've given you uh, meeting schedules. The Frick, uh, Frick Pittsburgh will uh, sponsor and it's gotten us a speaker uh, to talk about the Homestead Steel Strike next month. That should be uh, We have the head of the cultural district. We have the head of the cultural district coming to talk about the whole development of the west, uh, of the north side of downtown, which is a fascinating story. And you know they're involved in real estate development as well as uh, theater and whatever. And he's coming in November. I was very pleased that they were willing to do that. In December, uh, Barbara and I, uh, two of the authors in the book, we're going to do some stuff on some more stuff on Jews in Squirrel Hill, and uh, I'm going to talk about actually my family's wanderings as German. Barbara was going to talk about German Jews in Pittsburgh, and I'm going to talk about one one German Jewish family, my own and how they made their way to the U.S. So that'll be in December. Mm -hmm. So we That's like good. crowds like we're getting tonight. Uh, Helen's going to come up and talk about an important event. Why don't you do that from up here? Okay. okay. Uh, and uh, why don't you do it? Let's get started. So why don't you go ahead and do that? Then I'll introduce the members of the board of this organization and we'll get our program started. This is Helen Wilson, our vice president. Hello, everybody. And um, if you're getting, if you get the Squirrel Hill magazine, you might have seen the full-page ad. I can't believe they did that, which was nice for the Turner Cemetery History Walk, our ninth annual. And this year we have a special, a special history walk because one of our members has gotten a stake historical marker for Simon Gertie, which is a very rare and wonderful event to get a state historical marker. So this will be the dedication ceremony for that marker as well. So there's lots of, fe lots of festivities that day, and please pick up a flyer at, in the back if you want to know more about it. The schedule is on here. Everything from bagpipers to Corey O'Connor. <coughs> And um, one of the costas, I have to remember which. But anyway, so hope to see you there. Thank you. Um, we, uh, the uh, Squirrel Hill Historical Society, has made a small contribution to the Gertie sign, and we're also sort of acting as financial collector as a nonprofit for people that are making donations. Uh, the other day there, there was a donation from, uh, a big one, from up in Canada. Uh, Mr. Gertie uh, ended up his life uh, running away after the revolution to Canada. You'll hear more about him here in February, but there, there's a plaque up there. This the plaque here will be the third plaque for Mr. Gertie. And so he, he, he made a name for himself and they, they made a donation. Squirrel Hill Historical Society is extremely happy to have this nicer crowd tonight. And uh, we are a non-profit membership organization. We welcome members. We have nearly 200. Uh, I want to introduce the folks that keep this place going. I'm Mike Ehrman, and I'm president of the group. Uh, Helen Wilson, you just met, and you see her in a lot of her writings. And Ed Helen edited the book that we talked about. Uh, Betty Conley, our other vice president, is over here. Betty edited the first book. Some of you still remember that, the photo book that we put out in the mid-2005. And Betty's also an author in this book. Uh, we have board members here. We have Jim Hammond. I saw him. Jim Hammond is there. Ralph Lund is over here. Audrey Glickman is at the camera. And uh, uh, Evelyn Young, our treasurer, is at the back, uh, taking your money whenever, for whatever you'd like to give us money for, right? And um, we have uh, Patricia Hughes, who's our webmaster in the back, who's working on a, a major 
redoing of our, an upgrading of our, our website. And I'm looking around because I don't want to insult anyone. I think I caught all the board members. If I've insulted anyone, wave your hand so I can introduce you as well. Okay. So many, many years ago when I was a kid, I was living in Boulder, Colorado. And I uh, was very interested in radio. And I was interested in shortwave radio. And I was also interested in AM radio. And I used to sometimes at night, crazy thing to do, with see what radio stations I could get on my AM radio and uh, make a list of them. And in the time that I did that, the, the record holder was KBK in Pittsburgh. It came all the way out to Boulder. So I was always very conscious of the station long before we moved to Pittsburgh in 2000. So as we're always thinking of different kinds of talks to give you, hit me, KDK, because you're here as the first radio station in the country, why don't bring someone in to talk? And we're very happy, Michael Young, who is uh, general manager, uh, senior vice president, Pittsburgh market manager, and, pardon me for, for looking, uh, PJ Kumanchik, Kumanchik who's news director at KDK, been kind enough to come and tell us about their station and the early days of radio. Michael grew up in Bradford, PA, has been, he tells me, here since 1996. So he knows the station very well. Welcome. We enjoy hearing you tonight. Well, good evening, everybody. It's great to be here, and I want to thank Mike for the the invitation, uh, it's the longest invitation I have, I've ever had. I think Mike contacted me last summer. <laughs> and he said, do you want to you know, you want to come in in September? So I looked at September of 2016, I said, yeah, what's the, you know, what's the date? And he said, no, 2017. He says, we plan ahead. <laughs> so uh, it was great, and uh, um, we love coming out and talking about the radio station. Uh, a little bit of background on myself and I'll bring PJ up to give you a little bit of his background as well. As Mike said, I grew up in Bradford, small town and about 150 miles north of here. And uh, I've been in radio my whole professional career. Um, and uh, two things I wanted to do, I, I went to IUP, uh, and then I started working in radio in Buffalo, and there were two professional things I wanted to do. One was I always wanted to work for CBS, and I kept, uh, in the three years I was up in Buffalo from 1982 to 1985, I just kept sending my resume in, sending my resume in, you know, that was a lot of stamps and stuff. It's not electronic on how you apply for jobs to today. And I finally got a call, and I went in in my best polyester suit that I had in Buffalo and <laughs> went up there and pitched it and got the job. And the other thing I always wanted to do was work for KDKA. And 12 years later, after being in CBS in New York, Westinghouse bought, bought CBS. We, we hated Westinghouse at CBS, and Westinghouse hated CBS, and, and I, always, I always wondered, I said, boy, these guys are so dumb. They bought us, but they kept the CBS name. And at about two months after the, uh, the announce of the sale, someone came to me and they said, well, you're from Pennsylvania, and, and they're looking for a general sales manager out of KDKA, and uh, they want to talk to you. And so I ended up being the first transplant from CBS radio to what was the new CBS radio integrating Westinghouse. And... Uh, was very, very fortunate to, uh, to kind of have both of my professional wishes come true. I've been with CBS, this is my 33rd year, and it's my 21st year at, uh, at KDKA, and we're all very proud of the, of the radio station, and the gentleman who's been there a long time as well, I'd like to bring him up and let him introduce ourselves. This is PJ Kamanchik, he is our news director for KDKA and our executive producer for KDKAM, and also for KDKAM, or excuse me, KDKFM, Sports Radio 93.7 The Fan. So, PJ? Thank you, Michael. Um, thanks for inviting us and having us here this evening. Um, I'm a lifelong Pittsburgher. I grew up in the city on the north side. Could you, could you have it up a little closer? Right here. Is that good? Mm -hmm. So, I'm a lifelong Pittsburgher. I grew up on the north side, uh, went to school at Clarion University. And four months out of school, I was fortunate to be hired as a part-time producer at KDKA. I wanted to be the next Mike Lang. I wanted to be a professional football player. I realized I was too small, couldn't run. Then I wanted to be a 
radio announcer, Mike <coughs> Lang, um, was hired four months on a school at KDKA, and I've been with the radio station ever since. So I've been with the radio station 28 plus years. Um, it's been an outstanding ride. I've seen a lot of things uh, go on in my career at the radio station, and um, we hope tonight to share some of the things that we've done as, as a radio station with you, and hopefully we have some Q&A at the end of this uh, presentation. Raise the microphone. Raise the microphone, right here. Straight on. Okay, you got it. If, if, if I have the microphone too low, just remind me. <laughs> yes. So I think we've got a lot of really good history. We especially have got some very, very interesting early history that we're going to spend a lot of time on. And we're going to kind of walk you through radio from its beginnings to where it's at today. Um, if you'd like to ask questions during our talk, please just raise your hand or we can go through everything and take questions at the end, whatever is more convenient for you. But before we start our talk, what we'd like to do is we have about a uh, three-minute video. It's a series of slides and audio um, that is on KDKA, and I thought that would be a great way to kind of frame the evening and get everybody kind of um, settled in on what we're going to talk about tonight. So if you put your attention to the screen, I'll press this button and hope that it works. KDKA, the most legendary call letters in radio, launched radio broadcasting on November 2nd, 1920, and laid a foundation for the broadcasting industry to build upon. This is KDKA, the Westinghouse Electric and Manufacturing Company in East Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. This is the nation's first commercial radio station, KDKA of Pittsburgh. <laughs> KDKA not only began radio broadcasting, but was a leader in providing news, information, sports, and entertainment. Interrupt this program to bring you a special news bulletin. The Japanese have attacked Pearl Harbor, Hawaii. 96. I wonder how many of you remember Bill Steinbach looking for me in the afternoon during 90 to 6 because I was running down the hall getting sports stories. Me, yes, Cigna doing sports on 90 to 6. Can you remember? We were moved from the studio by security personnel because of a, of a fire inside. Mm -hmm. Here's my policy. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You don't know? Don't worry. Who? Uh, I'm sorry, Fred. Dan on a rod. Very exciting. And the snow is perfect for Tobias. Gary Richards, John Shumway. Good morning, God. Good morning. What? It's 79 degrees and the cooling centers are open. <laughs> Got issues. That was a great guess. My FinTech talks you through it. TDKA Afternoon News with Robert Mangino and Shelly Duffy. Did you cry? I'm a grown man. I don't cry. I'm Larry Richards. And I'm John Shelly. The most popular guy in the world. You see what that does. It's the original social network. Holy bananas. Well, Tom, thank you. And the rest of the JJ team. And I have no listen. Listen to what we started. This is Jack Benny. Exciting to, uh, to be a part of a lot of that uh, history 
and history is definitely um, what this radio station is full of. And um, it had some very interesting starts. Um, and that's kind of what uh, we want to take you through. We'll, we'll call it Broadcast Beginning. And, you know, I, I wish I would have, I was born in 1959. I wish I would have been born in 1909 and could have gone through some of the excitement that was in the 1920s, because just it just it just seemed as and, and you folks are probably aware of this too, being part of the Squirrel Hill Historical Society, there was just so much excitement and change going on in our in our country at that time. And I think there is some now. A lot of it's technology, tech, technology, but it was then too. So it was a very interesting uh, time. People were curious, and 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 our nation had some great curious leaders in the business world. And uh, one of them we're going to talk about for a little bit, I'm going to spend some time on him. His name was Frank Conrad. And Frank really uh, was one of the great minds uh, back at that time. And collectively in the radio business, uh, or in the broadcast business, we really owe Frank Conrad a, a, a debt of gratitude. He, he, he is his relentless curiosity and ingenuity is responsible for broadcasting today. And it started with radio. And Frank was born in Pittsburgh in, in 1874. And he was a son of a railroad mechanic. And that may have influenced a lot of his mechanical interests because he left school after the seventh grade. And by all accounts, he was considered a genius, all things mechanical and electronic. At the age of 16, he was rather young, Frank joined the Westinghouse, what was called the Westinghouse Electric and Manufacturing Company. And he joined as a bench hand. And seven years later, mostly due to his very, very remarkable ingenuity and, and, and mechanical ability, uh, he was promoted and began working with the Westinghouse Testing Department. By 1904, he had risen to the rank of general engineer. And in 1921, which was the year after radio began, he was appointed to assistant chief engineer at Westinghouse, and it was a position there that he held for the rest of his life, which lasted another 20 years. Conrad's interest in wireless came from a bet he made in 1912, and it was regarding the accuracy of his watch. He constructed a very, very crude radio receiver to pick up naval observations daily timing signals from Arlington, Virginia. Make sure I'm following along on the, on the slide. Um, so Frank experimented, he, he tinkered and tested, and he developed his radio work from the second floor of his garage behind his home in Wilkinsburg, just east of downtown Pittsburgh. And it was there that he constructed his transmitting station, and often worked until the wee hours of the morning, likely unaware that his intellect and his skills and efforts were about ready to forge the radio industry or the broadcasting industry. In the latter part of 1919, the, uh, World War I, uh, there was a ban on amateur radio, or, excuse me, there was, a, there was a ban on, I'm sorry, I misspoke. There was a ban on amateur radio up until the latter part of 1919, when the war ended, and Frank Conrad became known as one of the best amateur radio operators in the country, operating a amateur radio station called 8XK. And Frank discovered that a means of, of resting his very, very tired voice from talking and talking, he played music over a phonograph and discovered an overwhelming response from his audience who communicated their request to him. Now, it's not like today where you just text your request in or you call your request in. I would imagine it probably took a few days for someone to actually see Frank or get a note to Frank to make their request. Um, but, there, the, but his programs gained popularity and his stations made it into the newspaper, which even made his radio station even more and more popular. So one morning in September of 1920, Westinghouse executive by the name of Harry Davis saw a Horn's department store advertisement 
in the Pittsburgh Sun newspaper that was promoting an amateur was promoting amateur wireless sets wireless sets for ten dollars. At that time, radio sets were very very limited to tech savvy amateurs like Frank, who built their own. Uh, and Mr. Davis was aware of, of Frank Conrad's amateur radio activities as he was both Conrad's boss and he was a good friend. So shortly after seeing the ad, Davis set up a meeting with Frank and some other Westinghouse officials. Um, and Westinghouse during the war in the years that preceded this had invested a lot of time and money in manufacturing facilities. So they had an interest in selling sets. Um, but here was kind of the aha moment, if you will, or as I say, a defining moment, realizing that content was the key driver. Um, the company felt that it could sell these sets, but better yet, it could produce programs as a public service and can also publicize the Westinghouse name. So it kind of had that aha moment that it wasn't the pipe, that was what was really great. It was the oil that was in the pipe or the content that was over the air. So during that late meeting in, uh, whoops, what did I do, PJ? Sorry. Sorry about that, folks. So during that 1920 meeting in late September, Davis and Conrad designed and constructed a transmitter that Westinghouse was going to put on its rooftop and they decided they could do it in time for the election uh, for that year which was on November 2nd and uh, Harding and Cox were, were running. So under Conrad's supervision they built a 100 watt transmitter um, and they put it on top of the Westinghouse building and they applied for a license from the United States Department of Commerce and the company's application was, was accepted, and KDK and the and license was as KDKA. Now, a lot of people say, does KDK stand for anything? It does not. It was nearly, it was merely, excuse me, the next set of call letters on the license log. Right. So there's nothing significant uh, for KDKA. And then, on November, uh, excuse me, the station was licensed on October 27th and then it delivered the first broadcast which were the Harding-Cox election returns on November 2nd, 2020. Thank you. Or, er, excuse me, 2020. 1920. Um, Leo Rosenberg was a member of the Westinghouse Publicity Department and he was actually KDKA's first announcer. Frank Conrad actually was not on the scene for KDKA's first broadcast. Um, they felt that they built the transmitter so quickly that they hadn't tested it uh, adequately. So Frank stood by at his amateur station, ready to use that as a standby if the new KDKA equipment uh, failed. Uh, uh, it did not. It operated uh, properly. And along with Leo Rosenberg, there were three other people who manned uh, the KDK broadcast, uh, engineered by the name of William Thomas. There was a telephone line operator by the name of John Frazier. And, uh, you know, as any good company will, they had a backup. There was a gentleman by the name of R.J. McClellan. He was a standby that could have filled in for Rosenberg or any of these other two gentlemen. Uh, if something uh, went wrong. So, um, truly, the launch and success of KDKA are attributable to Frank Conrad, and I, I, I hope I didn't spend too much time on, on him, uh, but I felt that uh, uh, you'd be interested in that. Yes, sir? Now, you list him as Dr. Conrad. Where did he get his doctorate? I, I, uh, I do not know that. I, you I, don't know whether it's honorary or... or whether it was academic, I don't. I, yeah. I'm, I'm, I, and I, I can't answer that. I, you know, I do. I, I, I do know that he quit his formal uh, uh, school education mm -hmm. in the seventh grade, but he could have went back uh -huh. um, and got that academically. And I'm, I don't know the answer to that. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. We'll have to look it up. So, what I want to talk about next 
is um, just a little bit about what, you know, kind of what makes radio special. I'll call it radio's successful ingredients. And really, I, to, to me, and again, I'm biased, guys, because I'm, I've worked in radio all my life. Um, but radio's been around for over nine decades. In fact, we're, we're closing in on a on 100 years. KDK will be celebrating in 2020 our 100th year anniversary, and that's, that's going to be real special. We've already started talking about um, some plans for that. Um, but I call radio the Energizer Bunny. It has a tremendous amount of resiliency. PJ and I are going to talk about that today as we go through the decades, and you'll see the challenges that radio went through and how it responded to those challenges. And you'll also, we'll also give you some examples of that from KDKA. But I, I call it one resilient medium. And it, 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 it has had over and over and over again the ability to adapt, to change, to pivot, and to come out on top in some of the most adverse conditions uh, and competitive conditions that, that uh, are out there and absolutely has a remarkable history. Um, it's interesting that while technology continues to change and challenge us, um, but I don't think there's any business without that type of, 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 uh, uh, of impediments that are out there. Um, there are some things that were just as important in 1920 as they are today in 2017 to radio. And uh, I'll just uh, uh, share with you some of them. And imagine this if you're looking at this through the lens in 1920. So you had instantaneous news and information that was continuous. Um, you know, if something happened on uh, uh, September 12th, 2019, you probably didn't find out about it until the 20th or the 21st or maybe the 22nd. Now you're finding out about it 10 seconds after it happened, and we're accustomed to that. But imagine how exciting it was to get that back then. Uh, weather forecasts, emergencies, and alerts were very, very important back then. And just think how important our radio stations in Houston and in Texas and in Miami and Tampa and Naples were to people who lost all their power, who, who couldn't charge their cell phones, but maybe had uh, battery-powered radios that helped them get information. Radio plays a tremendous uh, service in emergencies and alerts. Um, it has a special relationship with the audience, and I don't, I don't think that matters whether you're young or old. I was interviewing a millennial a couple of years ago, and, and we were talking about satellite radio, and this young woman said to me, she goes, it has no soul like radio. She says, radio has a soul, and it does. And we, you know, particularly on our music stations, we challenge our audience, or excuse me, we challenge our, our, um, our announcers that... Don't overpower the music because people are still coming to the music, but they want your personality and they want it interjected. And I think when you, when you hear that, you feel that, right? Because it doesn't take you too far off the music or too far off the subject matter, but it gives you a sense that you're listening to a friend, a companion, to someone you know and someone you trust. And, and radio does that really better than any, any media that's out there. Um, Live sporting events and, and, and coverage, we're, we're home to the Pittsburgh Pirates on KDK-FM. KDK-AM was home to the Pittsburgh Pirates for years. Uh, in fact, PJ's going to share with you the, uh, some details on the first uh, baseball broadcast, but uh, um, <coughs> excuse me, uh, Pirates have been in the KDK family for years, and, and, and live sporting events are, are big. I was out the last uh, two nights, or excuse me, last Thursday night and then last night, and both nights when I was driving home from a dinner, I listened to the NFL on, on, on KDKA, because KDK-FM had the Pirates. And uh, uh, it's exciting. And then just entertainment, personalities, music, and talk. And what's interesting is when we were putting together things a couple of years ago when we started talking about the history of KDKA, we came upon... Uh, something that PJ is going to share with you, he's going to come up here. Um, what was, I, I think they called it their, their standards that were written back in the 1920s. And PJ is going to go over this with you and take you through the next couple of slides. 
But these things that he's about to share were written 90 years ago, or 95 years ago, and they're still valid today. So, PJ, I'll let you take, take, take over the next couple of slides. Well, from a content perspective, these early years established a bond between the radio and their listeners. Much of what you hear on the radio today is the same content that came out of the radio sets in those early years. News, information, sports, weather, entertainment, and music. And as Michael said, some 96 years ago, they established programming standards. And those programming standards were five of them. To work hand in hand with the press, to provide programs of interest and benefit to the greatest number of people, to avoid monotony. My favorite one. <laughs> <laughs> to assign distinctive features at regular times for the convenience of listeners, and to operate a daily service of regularly scheduled programs. It's the same things that we do today in radio. Appointment listening, captivating your audience, having them listen. The standards are the same. So the forethought and the vision of our, our early pioneers was remarkable. But in the early years, KDK Radio in the 20, 1921 um, had many firsts. Number one being the first U.S. presidential address, President Herbert Hoover, in January of 21, a speech on behalf of the European Relief Fund, which took place at Pittsburgh's Duquesne Club. There was the first presidential inaugural address, President Warren Harding, in March of 21. Our first live sporting event, a 10-round fight between Johnny Ray and Johnny Dundee from Pittsburgh's East Liberty Motor Square Garden. Yes, AAA, exactly, yes. Our first baseball play-by-play, -play, live broadcast in August of 21. The Pirates defeated the Phillies that particular evening, I should say afternoon, by a score of 8-5. to five. We had the first live band concert in March of 21. The musicians were Westinghouse employees. <laughs> we have a picture back at the radio station, and I kid you not, there's got to be 50 to 75 band members in this band. It's, it's incredible. We don't even have that many people at the radio station. <laughs> <laughs> we had the first farm reports in May of 21. KDK established the first radio newsroom in September of 21 with a direct link to the Pittsburgh Post. And we also hired the first world, the, fir the first full-time radio announcer, full-time radio announcer, Harold Arlen, who began in January of 21. By 1926, 20% of the households had a radio, and that doubled to 40% by 1930. Like many other radio stations, KDK was involved with a, with a network. KDK was part of the NBC network that carried one of the first national hit shows, Amos and Andy. <clears throat> its sponsors would link to the radio programs, such as the Wrigley Party and the Philco Hour. But as radio's popularity grew, radio sets expanded into automobiles as well. While the automobile radio was somewhat different and strange, it would later become a significant factor to a future competitive impediment. The Great Depression caused hardship, despair across the country. It was a very difficult time for many people, and they turned to radio for comfort and entertainment. We provided news and information. It became an outlet to lift spirits and entertain. 
which just added to the special bond between the medium was building with their audience. What's unique is, at one point, bedtime stories were read in the evening. It's a prime example of how radio integrated itself into our community. In the 1930s, radio grew tremendously. Nearly two-thirds of the country were hearing the radio. And now receivers, they were becoming more and more popular in automobiles. Providing entertainment was still a major factor, as listeners in Pittsburgh listened to Uncle Ed Chauncey in the morning and the musical sounds of Slim Ryan and the Wildcats at night. By 1941, just under 90% of all the homes in the U.S. had a radio in them, and 8 million radios were in cars. And though World War II slowed the manufacturing of radios, it did not slow down the usage of radios and the appetite listeners had for information on the war, as it was high. And Michael was going to shed some more light in regards to World War II and the resiliency of radio. So you heard PJ talk about just how exciting radio was in the 20s and 30s and it was on this fast track and you heard him talking about the bonds that, that radio was setting pe with people, whether it was the comfortness of a whole family sitting around a big council at night listening to music or someone on KDK reading bedtime stories. So it's grown and grown, and now we're getting to um, the end of World War II, so we're getting into the mid-40s and early 50s, and the radio sets are, are just flying off the shelves. And by 1952, radio sets were in 95% of American homes. That's astonishing, thinking that the medium was only 32 years old. And many of those homes had multiple sets. Um, technology was advancing, so the sets were easier to use. They weren't as crude as they were when radio launched. Um, they were also cheaper to buy, so more people could afford them. But technology also brought a major league challenge to radio. One that I think is probably its most formidable challenge and that is that radio brought on the emergence of television. And, you know, a lot of things happen. You know how showbiz people are. They want to go to the shiniest new toy out there. So television was a lot shinier than radio. So many of the national programs and stars that were on radio were flocking over to TV. And so radio was losing uh, some of its stars. and But radio responded in a unique way. And they adapted very, very well. Um, almost surprisingly well. And how they do that? They, they, they utilized um, unique local content to replace a lot of the stars that were uh, flocking towards TV. They got more involved in their communities. In fact, in 1946, a great example of KDKA started partnering with Children's Hospital of Pittsburgh, which the radio station still has an association with today. So the local roots of radio that started when the industry began proved very, very well as they started to uh, fight television. Um, you know, in KDKA in the 1950s, and, and some of you may rec uh, recognize some of these names, Arndt Palin, Reach Cordick, Ed and Wendy King, you know, they became household names here in Pittsburgh, and they were local stars. Um, and there was also another emergence that happened shortly after television came out, and it was very, very exciting. I call it the smartphone of the 50s, it's called the transistor radio. And what it did, and, and, it, and, and it really is this 
in the automobile to me that were the game changers for radio fighting TV is it made the medium portable. The medium was now everywhere and by 1958 radio was in 98% of all homes and again not to repeat what we said earlier but was there in multiple uh, units as well. So people just didn't have one radio, they had many. Now, it, it, you ever heard the expression, it's, it, it, it's great to be good, it's even better to be lucky? Yes. Yeah. So radio got a little lucky too. So what else happened in post World War II is you had this urban sprawl and this spread to the suburbs and just this um, massive amount of building everywhere outside of cities. Unprecedented. Just neighborhoods popping up all around. And what that did is it gave folks a little bit more time in their cars. Took them a little while longer to get to work. And there became an opportunity for radio for what we know today as drive time, which are peak listening periods for the medium, and so all these other things we did to fight off television, we got a little lucky with urban expansion out into the suburbs, and it played right into radio's hands with local personalities on, in, pardon me, in drive times to get people to and from work, and then the, the, the information that they would need on weather, the information they would need on traffic, you know, we always like to say, boy, we hope, we hope traffic is hell tomorrow. We really do. We don't want anybody to get hurt. But we just hope traffic is hell tomorrow because when it is, we got, we got, we got either more ears listening to KDKA or we have people listening to it longer. In fact, we just launched a, uh, we just launched a new uh, product extension on one of our HD3 stations on 107.9 HD3. It's called KDKA's Traffic and Weather Together. And it's just a constant loop of traffic and weather because that information is so important to consumers. So the 50s, very, very, and post-World War II, very, very exciting time for radio. You went to punch back into TV, and, and I think they scored, as a medium, they scored a knockout. So what happened in the 60s and 70s? You know, we entitled this radio versus radio because radio's next challenge kind of came within its own family. Up until the early 60s, late 50s maybe, radio was primarily on the AM band. Sets that were sold were primarily AM. FM was kind of esoteric, wasn't really, really relevant, wasn't in many cars, but that started changing because until 1961, FM broadcast in one channel. In 1961, that change is stereo broadcasts were authorized by the Federal Communications Commission. And it really made the band become more popular with music lovers. It, 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 the band offers much more fidelity in terms of music. It's less uh, susceptible to interference, the signals go farther, except for the AM Skywave. Uh, we heard Mike talk about how proud he was that he got uh, KDK out in Boulder. I don't know if he can get KDK out in Boulder, but you can get it in Florida. You can get it in parts of Canada. But it all, def it all depends on the Skywave at night. And as I was telling Mike when he was telling me that story, there's more and more interference out there today. Mm -hmm. Believe it or not, lights interfere with AM signals. There's more lights out there, there's broadband, so it's a little bit tougher. But, but back then, when there wasn't all that interference, it was really the fidelity that, uh, uh, that took folks to the FM band a little bit. So if you look at this from a benchmark, in the late 1950s, 2% of radio sets had a FM band on it. And by 1965, that went to 20%. So again, how did our Energizer Bunny respond with its resiliency? And what AM started to do, and is still doing today, is 
they started doing less and less of music because it's fidelity and they concentrated more on news and information in their programming mix. And that took a while, it didn't, didn't all just happen in the 60s. In fact, I think, uh, what was the year that KDK last played music? 1990. Yeah, so, so KDK why it integrated more information in those years, didn't stop completely playing music until the, until the early 1990s. Um, Bill Steinbach, which uh, uh, his, grandson his grandson is working for us today, William Steinbach as a producer, uh, was a legendary newsman on KDKA. Um, the manufacturers continued producing sets that had both AM and FM bands and the benefit to consumers was there was more products out there and um, more radio stations out there because obviously the number of radio stations increased on the FM band so there was a really good uh, uh, there was a really good benefit uh, on that as well. So, PJ, get the next slide. You know what? I just took I just did the slide that he was supposed to do. <laughs> Boy, I'm sorry about that. You know, you just get talking. If they paid me by the word, I think CBS would be broke. <laughs> so after the 60s and 70s, what happened next? Um, you know, radio attempted from a fidelity basis to level the field to FM stereo with a thing called uh, AM stereo. And uh, while the concept failed, KDK was the first station to broadcast in AM stereo in 1982. And it just, this was one of those things that, that didn't work out as well. I think we were trying to turn a bird into a fish. AM radio is what it is, it's not the fidelity of FM. Um, but a new product came on, came on the scene that, that threatened both AM and FM and that was cable TV. Um, and it began as a concept to enhance, you know, probably people where I grew up in Bradford where we didn't get very good reception and allowed us to get major market television and then after that cable channels uh, launched and uh, it really, you know, kind of gave a second wind to, uh, to television. And it really grew and it grew rapidly in the 80s, and by 1989, 53% of, or excuse me, 53 million households, pardon me, uh, subscribed to cable, and there were nearly already at that time 80 different program networks, and oh boy, I, I don't even know how many there is today, but there's a heck of a lot more than 80. And so radio adapted again, and adapted what I would call uh, quite well, and it did it by developing more and more specialty programming. In 1984, um, what was WNBC in New York became WFAN and became the first all sports radio station. Today, including here in Pittsburgh with KDKFM, you have, <coughs> pardon me, hundreds of very, very successful sports radio stations out there. Radio formats started to fragment and become more specialized. So instead of just rock and roll, you had new rock and roll, classic rock and roll, um, uh, heavy metal rock and roll. <clears throat> you had jazz stations. Uh, instead of just adult contemporary stations, you had uh, contemporary hit radio, you had classic hits radio, you had hot adult contemporary stations, all fragmented in format, all to serve people's individual needs on music and information. And it really was a great answer to cable because now there was more and more variety out there for the consumer to pick from, just like there was on cable. And it uh, allowed, um, I should put the next point up there. Oops. 
and allowed radio to, to, uh, uh, to compete, and it kept to its roots about being local. It kept to its roots about having personalities that were relevant to the station and relevant to the products that it had specialized in. So radio, again, back to a lot of the roots that PJ was mentioning, those program standards on KDKA, those things that we talked about in the beginning of the presentation, all were still relevant today, even though technology has changed. And technology is continuing to change as we get to our final side, which is entitled Radio and the Future. And I'll begin by saying on, on this final slide, um, with all sincerity, that radio is as relevant and as innovative today as it was in 1920 when Frank Conrad began. Um, there's not a business out there that has, has been not impacted, some more than others, by the internet. I always call it BI and AI. You know, what was your business like before the internet? What was your business like after the internet? Um, take the newspapers. They, they didn't know what to do. I mean, they, you know, today they've all got websites, but they were very um, scared of putting their content originally out of print, losing subscriptions, <coughs> pardon me, losing ad revenue and readership over to the internet. Radio has embraced technology and has embraced the emergence of the internet. And I think what, what we're seeing is that we're becoming more than just a radio station platform, we're becoming a multimedia platform. Where our websites uh, engage our listeners in terms of giving them more information on the, on the radio stations. When I was a kid, Growing up, and I was listening to stations in Buffalo, New York, and I was listening to stations in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. I said, what do those guys look like? You know, they look good, they look ugly, are they, are they skinny, are they fat, or they, you know, what do they, what do they look like? Because no one ever looks like what they sound. You know, now you, you can see the personalities on the air. <coughs> um, they're doing video podcasts, they're doing audio podcasts, they're extensions of the radio station. And then with social media, there's so much engagement. Uh, we just built a digital media center inside our radio stations where our, and there's a monitor, there's, a, there's, a, there's four big monitors, right, PJ, that we have in our newsroom. Yes. And then in each of our radio stations, which there's four, which by the way are KDK AM, these are the four CBS stations, KDK AM, KDK FM, WBZZ, and WDSY. And each of them have a monitor in there and they can see what trends are hot in social media. In other words, what is the audience following right now? Whether it's something that happened in Pittsburgh where the Pirates really lost or the Steelers won or Penn State beat Pitt or could be more national stories such as the, the hurricane that was uh, Hurricane Irma. And we can see how we're doing against competitive media. And that interaction, what, uh, uh, what an announcer, whether that be a talk show host like Marty Griffin uh, a news anchor like Paul Rasmussen, or a morning show host like uh, Mark Snyder, who goes by Bubba on BZZ, puts out in those posts on, on Facebook or, or uh, um, uh, Twitter, all are a part of the show. And they've got a strategy on what they do, why they're on the air, and then they have a strategy of how they promote it when they're off the air. So um, radio, um, is very, very relevant today in terms of kind of reinventing itself and embracing the competition of the internet and not looking at it as a competition of the internet. Um, you know, we're, we're, we're always pleased to come out and, and, and speak with folks who are our listeners, and we respect uh, PJ and I as well as all the employees of KDKA that KDKA is what it is because of you and because of other listeners, you've invited us into your homes, into your cars, into your families. And it is a very, very integral part of the fabric of this community, Pittsburgh. And again, why technology changes, 
we respect that our job is to keep that legacy still going. Um, you know, you can evaluate the job we're doing, and we're not, you know, we're, we're certainly not perfect at what we do, but what we try and do is to live that every day, and we have a great deal of respect for that. Um, radio has demonstrated the ability to evolve and adapt. Again, if PJ were to read those five programming standards today, I think those are all relevant. I love, again, I love the one about avoiding uh, monotony. I always remind our guys that one. Um, uh, but I think those things don't change with technology. You know, and the questions that, uh, that we have is, you know, you know how do we, how, do, how does radio as a medium continue 100 years of success into the future? And what will radio look and sound like in the next 10 to 20 years? You know, again, I think it's a lot of what we just talked about. It's multi-platform. And what will audiences expect of radio in the future? I think they're still going to want to be entertained, informed. They're going to want to know about emergencies. And they're still going to think of radio as a friend. So um, I just want to thank Mike and the Historical Society of Squirrel Hill for inviting us out to share with you a little bit about a place that PJ and I work in that we that we really love. And uh, Mike, I don't know how much time we have, but we'll... We've got all the questions we can do. Okay, so PJ, you want to come up and we'll, we'll try and answer them uh, best we can. Yes, sir. I grew up in Forest Hills and uh, uh, there was a place that was almost like a community center, the Westinghouse Recreation Center. There was a building there that they have since remodeled. But inside that building, I want, and there used to be an antenna on top of it. I always wondered whether that was the origin or that was the studio of KDK Radio. If on one of your second slides, there was a, some women sitting there with these panels with, the, with, the, with the vertical lines up. I remember that on the inside of the building. So the question is, where was the original station? Was it in Forest Hills or was it in uh, the, the um the original station was in, excuse me, Michael. The original station was in East Pittsburgh. Uh, Wilkinsburg was the original um, studio and transmitter was in East Pittsburgh. Then uh, it moved from East Pittsburgh to Grant Street. We were on timeline too. Right? And we were on Grant Street. Um, yes, we're in the, in the Grant building. So the timeline? I do. Okay. So we were in East Pittsburgh from 1920 until 1934, to the best of my knowledge. And we went from East Pittsburgh to Grant Street, and we're on Grant Street from 1934 to 1955, 56, when we moved into the brand spanking new Gateway Center. And we were in Gateway Center from 1956 to 2010, and we currently are in Foster Plaza and Green Tree right now. I think it was perhaps then some sort of auxiliary to the station because it was equipped with this radio antenna. Yeah, it may have been. There's always backup plans in terms of if the studio goes down, what's our backup, where, where do we have to go in case of an emergency. So we do have those contingency plans, and that may have been a contingency perhaps. plan, but I don't yeah. know. All right. Yeah, to, 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 to that point, I mean, imagine that your business is open 24-7, 365, and never shuts down. So our engineers are anal. They have a backup to a backup to a backup to a backup. And, and, and you know what, and, and I, I kid them, uh, you know, because if you're around engineers a lot, you can, you know, you'll start carrying a slide rule in your pocket after, after a while. But, but very rarely do we go down for any more than 10 or 15 seconds. And, and that's a long time if they don't have that backed up. So there was another gentleman. Yes, sir. I was just going to say an answer to an earlier question, according to Wikipedia, which never lies, uh, Dr. Conrad received an honorary degree from, in science from the University of Pittsburgh in 1928. Good. Yes. Wow, that's great. And that's, yeah, thank you. And that's probably not surprising given no. his, just his intellect. Yes, sir. When did KDKA sell its first commercial? You know, I don't know, but it, my, my, my guess is, is that it was pretty quick after the uh, um, 
initial broadcast because I think that was one of uh, uh, Harris's ideas. And, uh, you know, it's funny because we, we have a couple of other heritage stations inside CBS. One of them's WWJ in uh, Detroit. One of them's KCBS in uh, San Francisco. And we always talk about who had the first broadcast. And I said, well, we were the first licensed commercial station, so we figured out how to sell it before we put it on the air, <laughs> is what I always tell them. But uh, I think it was very shortly after, but I don't have the, the exact date. Yes, sir. Uh, is uh, KDKA the only station east of the Mississippi with call letters that start with a K? KQV. It is not. Uh, you have one here in Pittsburgh. Uh, just, oh, just gentleman just mentioned KQV. We have one in Philadelphia that is owned by CBS. That is KYW. Are there others, PJ? There, yeah, and there's a couple of W's uh, that are stations that begin with W that are on the west side of the Mississippi, but. For the most part, that's the uh, that's the dividing line between call letters that begin with a W and begin with a K. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. One of the other innovations of radio, in addition to entertaining, was also uh, people who were visually impaired or could not turn a page. And for many years, I was a volunteer along with about 300 others with a group called the Golden Triangle Radio Information Center of Pittsburgh. And it, what we did was we had a special uh, signal that piggybacked over uh, Duquesne University signal. And what we would do is specialty programming for those who were visually impaired, like we would read whatever newspapers that were available, as well as books and magazines, and kept that particular, uh, kept that group of uh, people entertained. Now, even though RIS is no longer in business, there are some other radio reading services around the country that do the same thing, but they're also on radio, and they've also adapted to the internet as well as other ways of communicating with those who are visually impaired. Thought I'd point that out. No, it's a great service, and I think, you know, radio is a companion for everyone, but is especially com it's especially a companion for folks that uh, are by themselves, uh, or may have lost their sight, or, or, or maybe not as mobile, and it connects them uh, to, the, to, to, to the world, and that goes back to those virtues that we talked to in the beginning of the presentation about how radio is a companion mm -hmm. uh, uh, to listeners. When you're in your car and you're listening to, you know, let's just say you're listening to Marty Griffin, I mean, he's your friend at that point. It's, it's kind of, he's talking to you, even though he's talking to thousands of other people. You had a question, sir. Well, I have an experience. Uh, right at the end of World War II, um, I went through a quick basic training and uh, was sent overseas and stationed in a battalion aid station in the uh, Julian Alps. Uh, and the thing that distinguished me from everybody else was that when I left Philadelphia to go overseas, my aunt gave me a radio to take with me. And when, when the guys in the aid station discovered that I had a radio, we went over. I, I didn't know that it would work there. We went over and there were, you know, they're all as techie guys in the Army. And they spent a day or two. And the next thing I knew, my radio was what we did when there was nothing else to do, when it was snowing in the Alps, you know, and you couldn't go on patrol and there was nothing to patrol anyway. Uh, we would go into the battalion aid station uh, and listen to the radio and he did manage to get a station broadcast from, from somewhere in, from a military base in South Italy that was broadcasting American music of one kind or another. Uh, and it, uh, so I've been grateful to radio for, <laughs> forever. <laughs> no, that's a, that's, a very, that's a very interesting story. We get these radio operators, no, we didn't get and they're in different continents, yeah. and they'll send us a card, uh, or now they do it in email, uh, it used to be a card, uh, and they'll have embedded in there audio that they've recorded, and they could be four or five thousand miles away. And it's faint, but they, but they hear it, and they collect this from from different radio stations. So it, the radio signal is really 
can, you know, they're, yeah. they're designed to serve local communities, uh, but they do travel. There was another gentleman, or another hand that was raised over here. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Um, you want to? You want to? No, the um, they, they've uh, the building. Um, they've taken the building. They've taken the building down. Uh, but uh, it was a garage in, uh, in in East Pittsburgh. I think actually right now, right in the location, right next to it, there's a there was a Wendy's. Wendy's out there. Yeah, but they've taken the uh, the building down. The the bricks are still in housing, in hopes that locally that we are um, the radio industry and the historical radio industry is able to raise enough funds to resurrect the building and, and place it as a historical landmark. So the bricks are still around, but the building is no longer there. <laughs> Okay. Oh, sure. Mm -hmm. Michael, I have one. Uh, as a kid, of course, we had radio dramas that then shifted over to TV uh, and the reading of the comics on Saturday morning, but Sky King, Roy Rogers. Did uh, KDKA partake in that, or who were the stations that did this? In just this I wasn't here, so I... So, so the question was about old radio programs that were authentic back in the uh, in the day in the 20s and 30s and 40s and are they, are no, they no the question is were you the one of the stations in this market that ran those programs or were, did someone else do oh that? yeah we were we were one of the stations that ran them back then because largely they were they were network programs so some of them would have been on what was the NBC radio network that KDK was on but there's also some syndicators out there today that are uh, running old-time radio, and, and we ran some of those. I don't know if we're doing them now. We, uh, we run a show. Um, we run a show on the weekends. It is Saturday into Sunday. It's called Hollywood 360, and a lot of times they play uh, old um, programs from back in the 50s and the 40s and whatnot. We also do a uh, program, we do the Twilight Zone, that airs overnight on Saturday mornings. It's a two-hour program. It airs from 1 a.m. to 3 a.m. And it's all the old stories, but with today's actors reading it. And it's um, really incredible. It's a throwback, and it's fascinating radio. Um, and when you talk about uh, do we air certain programs, locally we generated programs too. And it was probably about <laughs> five years ago I happen to be listening to some old Reach Cordic bits. He was on our radio station. The humor that he had back in the 50s still stands today. And it's just as funny as what's coming out of the speakers nowadays. It was fascinating. I mean, he had a, a team of about eight writers, which, you know, now we have a, a writer or two that, that helps contribute to the program. But it was fascinating what, uh, what, what he was able to do. What radio used to do is before any program hit the air, you would get into a listening room and it would be rehearsed and you'd get into a listening room and you'd listen to something off air in audition mode that never hit the air. And if it was to the liking of the four or five people that were listening to it, then it would make the air. So at the time they had the opportunity to rehearse things, make sure it sounded good, and then it would hit the air. Now it's a little bit different today. Um, but I think that's pretty interesting in terms of the historic things of radio. Rich Corey went to California. He was not as successful as he was in Pittsburgh. That's correct. That's correct. But the station itself and the morning show at KDK still succeeded. Right. Yes. We have a question hidden in the back drop behind you first. Okay. Yes, sir. Well, somebody might remember Fibber, Fibber McGee and Paul. That's about Super McGee and Mullen. I'm sorry? Oh boy, see, I, I obviously don't remember. I don't, so I, I, BJ, can you comment on that? I don't. Yes, sir. In the center of the country, a hugely important national farm in Fulmauer in the 30s. Did it ever reach Pittsburgh? 
He asked about a uh, farm hour that was very popular in the 30s and 40s out of the country. Um, there are farm reports that are still carried by two of our CBS stations, WCCO and KMOX. KDKA carried farm reports uh, back in the uh, 20s and 30s and 40s, but I don't know if that was the origin. <coughs> So it was an entire hour. It was entire. Yeah, and I don't know the length of the report, so um, I can't af answer that with any uh, uh, with any accuracy. Other person, center of the country. Yes, ma'am. You have the picture of the marker on your presentation. Yes. Where is that, and what does it say? Okay, I'll I'll uh, read it. It is outside of Gateway Center. It's a historical market. It reads, radio station KDKA, world's first commercial station began operating November 2nd, 1920, when KDKA reporting Harding Cox election returns from a makeshift studio at the East Pittsburgh Works of the Westinghouse Music Sports, or, uh, excuse me, at the East Pittsburgh Works of Westinghouse. And the next sentence reads, music, sports, talk, and special events were soon being regularly added. Thank you. You're welcome. Anything else? One, one other. How did the call sign KDKA come into view? It was the next, uh, there was, there's no meaning to it. It was simply letters that were assigned uh, from the government, from the U.S. Department of Commerce, and it was the next set of letters up. And then after that, the FCC was formed and then became call letters beginning with a W on this side of the Mississippi and call letters beginning with a K on the other side of the Mississippi. Go ahead. The fairness doctrine that was eliminated by Ronald Reagan in 1987, how do you think that has, obviously it has affected radio, but what is your perspective being professional? You know, as a, as a professional, um, and we tell this particularly to our host, she was asking about the Fairness Doctrine um, and what we think of it as broadcasters. Um, I, I would say that I, I, I believe that each host is entitled to his or her opinion, and, they have the, and we don't tell them what opinions to have. So our, you know, if there's an issue that's out of the day, we could be all on the conservative side of it or all the hosts could be on the liberal side of it. So we're not looking to balance that with opinions, but what we are looking to is to balance that with discussion and to have those people be responsible in having those conversations. Thank you for an extraordinarily special evening. We do not have to rush out of here. We can have informal discussions. M many of you know our, our rule. Please take your chair. Someone will help you show where to put it. This is a, the co-op at the end of the meeting. We've got books at the back. On the 23rd of the month is the third of the Squirrel Hill Night Markets. You should go to it if you haven't been. It's a great event. We have a booth which starts, we start setting up at 4 o'clock. The leadership of the organization has been manning the booth. They would welcome anyone else, members, others, who want to meet nice people, help us sell our books, and tell people about the historical society. It'll be more or less in front of the Key Bank on Murray Avenue, and our people will start being there at 4 o'clock. Uh, the uh, Frick Pittsburgh has gathered a very impressive group of speakers. Uh, I'm sure next month will we'll, we'll be extremely interesting on the, uh, the strike at Homestead. We haven't had a talk on that for a while. I urge all of you to come. Uh, thank you very much for being here tonight.